Gordon Olson. And the purpose of this, as we've explained many times, is to take somebody's textbook one time in our entire program, use it as our outline for studying, and we've chosen this for the moral government of God. Uh, <clears throat> we've told you that Olson put 25 years of research in on this, spent one entire summer down at Hillsdale College. I don't know whether you've ever been to Hillsdale or not, but uh, once in a while I have to take Karen to Hillsdale for a deposition, and I wait for her, and I go up into the Hillsdale College Library, and here's um, all kinds of books by um, a lot of people out of the 1800s that were teaching the moral government of God, Taylor, Finney, and others. But Olson put 25 years of research on this before he wrote it, and therefore I, I knew him personally. I'd sat under his ministry, I'd ministered with him, and uh, I felt that this would be a great tribute to him to use his writing and continue on because the man uh, had the truth. He was able to put it down into a teaching manual, uh, something which Finney has in large theological books. He was able to reduce it to a teaching premise, and that I liked. Chapter 15, we'll try to get through this in a couple of weeks. If not, we'll take three. But So chapter 15 of Olson's book is the truth about our participation in God's activities. We've been through everything else for 14 chapters to get us saved, to bring us into a union with God, to equip ourselves with the word and truth. And now we want to participate, learn to work with him, not against him, but with him, in what he's doing and where he's headed. As uh, usual, Olson gives scriptures right at the beginning, and the first one's out of 1 Corinthians 3, 9. We are God's fellow workers. You are God's field in which he's using to grow his product, redeemed people. You are God's building. He is putting us together. Then from 2 Corinthians 5.20, we beg you on the behalf of Christ, be reconciled, be rejoined, be united, be connected to God. Acts chapter 1, verse 8, you shall receive the power when, or the King James says, after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses. At that time, not only in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, but the uttermost parts of the world. The same applies today. Now, the Lord Jesus viewed the winning of one soul or one person as of such great value that all the possessions of the world would not balance it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Out of Mark eight thirty six and 37. Since it is a persistent effort of the Godhead for all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of truth, that's God's will, that all men would be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. The only possible way to have divine fellowship with God is to rise up and busy ourselves in a similar manner of being filled with the Spirit, equipping ourselves with the Word, and going out and sharing it in some form or another. The greatest thing we can do every morning is ask the Lord to run us across somebody else's path or run somebody across our path that we might begin to share with. And that doesn't mean we're going to lead them to Christ necessarily. Yes, we would if they were at that stage. But the Bible says to lay hands on no man suddenly. We're not trying to get, again, notches on our gun to see how many we've saved, which many organizations operate with that thought. That's carnal. Our job is to water, plant, keep, whatever, and if we get a harvest, fine. But that's not the daily thing. And so we're praying every day, Lord, lead somebody to me or lead me to somebody else. All who are owned by the Lord Jesus, because we've given ourselves to him, we've given him the title deed, the property. <clears throat> All who are owned by the Lord Jesus are to be his ambassadors. We do not give God our time. God owns our time. Now at the top of page three, underline the opening sentence here. The representatives of God must absolutely speak God's message in God's way. And what do we have out here in the world today? In radio, television, and books, we got people speaking a religious message in their own way. It doesn't sound like God anymore. We were coming home from Upper Michigan last night, Northern Michigan, and Karen kicked on the radio to try to find a religious broadcast, and we found one. 
but in three minutes we were off of that looking for another. This guy was just slicing the word to pieces, and here he is on radio, national radio, and he's just cutting the word of God all to pieces. Couldn't stand to listen to it. Well, point number one, what are the members of the Godhead seeking to accomplish? Okay, what are we seeking? What's step number one? What are we going for? Sub point number one, <coughs> it was in no sense, no will, no thought, no imagination in God's will that sin should ever have entered into the world. Now, that doesn't mean God didn't know the possibility, but he never created man to sin. Love requires free choice. That's what God has. God made him in his image, gave him the same thing. He knew they could fall, they could fall away. Now, just look at this in Acts 17, 24, and then 28. Paul speaking here on Mars Hill to the Greeks who even have a little standard set there to the unknown God, and he's preaching, I'm telling you about the unknown God. You don't know him. Here he is. 17, 24. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. Now move down to 28. For in him, God, we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. But they didn't know who that God was, but they realized they were the offspring of some God. And then Matthew 6.10. God had the knowledge that there could be a fall since he'd seen one-third of the angels fall, did not anticipate it, did not think in advance about how they might fall and labor on that one. The only thing he planned in advance that if man ever did choose to fall anywhere along the line, that God had a program to redeem men. So in Matthew 6, 10, Thy kingdom come, Christ is teaching the disciples to pray, Thy will, God, be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's the purpose of us when we go out. Subpoint number two, it is God's objective, it's his purpose, that everyone, underline that word, everyone should come to the knowledge of truth and be saved. God has no elected, predestined, or programmed, or predetermined favorites. Let's go to Mark 16. These are good scriptures to remember and mark down, perhaps in your Bible. Once you understand these, you realize that God did not have any knowledge of this thing in the beginning. These would become lies. He wants to harvest everybody that's lost, but he didn't want them lost in the first place. Once the fall occurs, then he's going to bring forth a Messiah that will redeem everybody if everybody wants to be redeemed. Verse 15, Christ says to the disciples, Go ye into all the predestined world where I've already predestined and chose them, and preach the predestined gospel to every predestined creature. I guess not. The condition is 16, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that chooses not to believe shall, shall be damned. If he believes not, he's going to be damned. So he gives you the condition right off the bat. He has no favorites out there. He's not a respecter of persons. If he does, he's a sinner. John 3.17, right after our 3.16. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world. Christ didn't come to condemn the world. He's coming the last time, the final time for that. He didn't come to condemn the world, but that the world through him, his Son, Jesus Christ, might, here is your Greek word, perhaps, maybe be saved. Of course, we know that it's not his will that any should be lost, so we're understanding this. Then over to 1 Timothy 2, 3, and 4. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. What's good and acceptable, Paul? Well, God our Savior, who will... Now, the word will here in the Greek is not the absolute will of creation, to speak something and see, boom, it comes into existence. The will 
here in the Greek is to wish or desire. And you have to watch that because it's used many places when people try to pound it down to some fixed, absolute will of God. God who will desire, wish that all men to be saved and come under the knowledge of the truth. He can't force or cause or he caused everybody. If he knew how to cause and he wasn't causing them all, then he's guilty of sin because he knows how to do a good thing and he's not doing it. But no, it's a will. It's a wish. It's a desire. But it depends on whether man will do it or not. Subpoint number three, salvation and the sacred atonement of Christ has been provided for all universally. Doesn't make a difference where you are. That's John 3.16. For God so loved what part of the world? The whole world. That if anybody, see, he's given his son, and if anybody, all of them. We read the Timothy. Let's do the Hebrew 2.9. <clears throat> but we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels. He had, uh, Jesus had to have a flesh body, didn't he, because he's going to die. So he's made lower in the spectrum of created beings than the angels. For what purpose? For the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor because of his obedience, not because he formally was somebody, it's only because of his life on earth, that he, by the grace of God, the total provision of God, should taste or personally experience death for how many people? For every person, whether they ever repent or not. This is why final judgment is going to be such a horrible place for billions of people. And it says when he casts them out away from the final judgment, there'll be cursing and gnashing of teeth. Every foul thing in the world is going to be uttered by these people as they're thrown away. They'll hate him for eternity. They don't want anything to do with him. 1 Timothy 2, 5 through 6 For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. A. It upholds God's moral government by showing forth the awful nature or consequences of sin and its just due of eternal punishment, thus providing a moral force of consequences in restraining sin. Page 6 at the top, B, it reveals God's inner hatred of sin and how terrifying have been the effects of sin upon the members of the Godhead, thus the true depth of redeeming love. C, it furnishes the cross, the crushing force to subdue the tremendous structure of human pride, humbling man to the place where God can finally pour out a storehouse of blessings and tender kindness. But the person's got to be humbled first, hasn't he? He's got to be in a state of godly sorrow, godly repentance, or God can't get him. You, can't, you don't bring your pride to the altar and say, okay, here I am with my pride, save me. D, the cross provides the mean for man's complete, absolute transformation and affectionate or loving motivation and the newness of a life. Now, <clears throat> underline this. God's done the whole thing, so here we are. The only thing left is, is for man, speaking of mankind, women, men, children. The only thing left is for man to repent of all previous past sin and stupidity, which it is, and seek the face of God in proper godly humbleness, identifying himself in a committal of faith to the sufferings of Jesus Christ for his sins as the only hope of his forgiveness and spiritual restoration from a state of ruin. It can't be church membership. It can't be doing good things. It can't be paying money. Number four, it is man's will. Oh, highlight the word will. It is man's will or free choice in response to God's loving approach of mercy that determines man's salvation. It isn't God. God offers the whole program. It's man's will that determines his salvation. God will never coerce or force or cause the sanctity of man's moral freedom to do anything. He just can't do it. If he did, he's got a robot. God's working off of love. Love says, choose you this day whom you're going to serve. 
Isaiah 1 19. Isaiah 1 verse 19 through 20. If ye be willing and obedient, ye shall eat the good of the land. But if ye refuse and rebel, ye shall be devoured with the sword, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. Ezekiel 18. Let's look at this. We've seen this a million times, but again, I preach out of Ezekiel 18 on sin. Before I go to 1 John, I use Ezekiel 18. We're only going to do 30 and 32. Ezekiel 18, 30. Therefore, after he gets through of telling you about the righteous and the unrighteous, the unrighteous can become righteous. The righteous can go back and become unrighteous. It shows freedom, once saved, not always saved. He says now, through Ezekiel the prophet, Therefore I will judge you, O house of Israel, every one according to his own individual personal ways, saith the Lord God. So what does he say? Repent. Turn around. Turn yourselves. Notice it isn't God that's going to turn you. Turn yourselves from all your transgressions, not Adam and Eve's or mom and dad's, so that sin, iniquity, and transgression shall not be your ultimate eternal ruin. Well, look what he goes on to. Cast away, throw away from you. You do the casting, you do the throwing. Where from? Away from you, all, not part of, all of your transgressions, whereby you have transgressed, and you make or make you by your crying out and confession and repentance and asking Christ to come to be your Savior, you make yourself a new heart and new spirit. God's got it ready to go. For why will you die, O house of Israel? Bottom line, for I, God says, I have no pleasure in the death of any man, woman, boy, or girl that dies spiritually, saith the Lord God. Bottom line to that one is, wherefore then, you turn yourself around and you can have life. That's so simple that even I can understand it. That's got to be simple. Revelation 3.20, of course, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Notice if you ever seen a picture of Christ knocking on the door, there was never any latch on the door on the outside. He's knocking on the door of our heart. We're the one who have to open up and invite him to come in and sup with us and we with him. Our second major question, how was a person brought to repentance and salvation, and what agencies are involved? So let's start first with the Holy Spirit. Number one, the Holy Spirit, as the delegated agent of the Godhead, takes the initiative in salvation and in the transformation of the whole personality of the repentant sinner through the application of of the atoning sacrifice of Christ and the gift of his energizing presence. The Holy Spirit, A, enlightens or illuminates every man as to his moral obligations. B, he seeks to restrain every man from sin. Seeks to restrain doesn't mean cause, but he seeks to restrain. C, the Holy Spirit exerts powerful convictions of guilt. D, manifests the moving love of God through the gospel proclamation. E, seeks to persuade all to renounce sin and be saved. F, he washes, cleanses, sanctifies the whole inner being of repentant sinners, that is their spirit, by uniting their minds with the sacred atoning love of Christ in the committal of faith. G, the Holy Spirit purifies repentant sinners become partakers of the divine nature. Now, here he's got an error, and you need to draw a line through this. Put a period right after the word divine nature. The next statements here is wrong, through the gift of his intimate dwelling, indwelling presence. No. See, he's talking about the Holy Ghost coming in you when you're born again. No, that's not true. Olson never was baptized with the Holy Spirit. He had just believed the lie of the denomination that you receive the Holy Spirit when you're born. No, you don't. When you're born again, it's your spirit that's changed. Your dead spirit is removed, washed, and cleansed from sin, and it's your dead spirit that is born again or united or joined with God as one spirit. 
then that being, that individual person, has to be baptized with the Holy Ghost, who upon asking the Father in Jesus' name to baptize you with the Holy Spirit, he then will come in and dwell within you. But it is not a part of salvation, so you want to just draw a line through the gift of his intimate indwelling presence. No. Subpoint two on page 10. God's servants as free moral agents make choice to exert similar persuasion and how they have a vital active part in turning to obedience and in their transformation to walk in newness of life. A. God's fellow workers must live a sacrificial life. We must be manifesting and showing forth the compassion of Christ. And again, all of these scriptures that are underlined are proof of the statement he's making. They're all good scriptures. We must be living a loving, sacrificial life. B, we must be faithful witnesses in the revealed truth of God and the gospel. We must know his truth. We must have measured it with others. There must be two, three or more witnesses. We must stay with what he says. We can't be pushed to the left or the right by denominations or anybody else's theology. C, we must engage wholeheartedly and urgently in the Holy Spirit-anointed persuasion, yet with love and kindness of Christ as representing the Godhead. We're not trying to lead them to us. We're not trying to lead them to the church. We're trying to get them connected with God, and so we should have that love and kindness that Christ had. D, we must labor with great persistency and a spiritual travail of prayer for God's special guidance and visitation upon specific individuals who we know are in the process of salvation since Jesus said, apart from me, you can't do anything. And since God is not one to show partiality, no favorites, God has no special elected favorites. And that's what these verses are going to share with you here. It's always all whosoever, as many will come. Subpoint three. The subject, as a moral being, is able to resist, isn't he? All the measures that can be taken towards his salvation, and underline this, he must of his own free will respond to the truth, break down his heart before God, turn from all known sin, coming to Christ in a total 100% committal of faith to participate to participate in his own transformation of heart and life as the Holy Spirit illumines his mind on the life and sufferings of the Savior. A, page 12, man must no longer willingly suppress the truth in unrighteousness. That's what Romans 1.18 says he's doing. God's wrath is against man because he is suppressing the truth in unrighteousness. He's got it inside of him. But man must no longer suppress the truth and righteousness. He must stop resisting and quenching the Holy Ghost who has been striving against our way of living. B, as the resurrected Savior stands and knocks for admission, man must awake, sleeper, and arise from the dead. Hear his voice and open the door to his whole life. Man must come to God in faith. There's two words, in faith. God already tells us, Romans 12, 2, he's already dealt man the measure of faith, which means he's already given man the ability and capacity to believe if he use it. So man's got to come to God in faith. He must believe that God is and that he's a rewarder of those that seek him. D, man must repent or solemnly resolve to have a complete change of mind and be willing to live according to the God-man perspective of truth in all his moral relations, turning from darkness to light and from the dominion of Satan to God. E, the subject must believe the gospel or exercise complete trust in the atoning death of the Savior for the forgiveness of past sins. Number four, the truth is revealed in the Bible, the Word of God, and particularly the record of the coming, the life, the teaching, and the atoning death of the Lord Jesus is used as an instrument by both the Holy Spirit and God's fellow workers in the process of moral enlightenment and persuasion and provides the means through which the innermost being of the repentant sinner is purified and quickened to a newness of life.
at point three, which we finished last week. I didn't want to get started because you can see it's rather long. And the question that Olson proposes is this. What has been God's manner of approach? What's his approach in seeking to turn men from sin into a heart or warm-hearted divine relationship? What's his manner of approach to reach the lost? Now, Olson says in the following passages of Scripture are examples of God's intelligent approach towards man in seeking to persuade men to turn from their sin and in various decisions and plans that have been made as a wise and benevolent or loving moral governor. Number one, God explained to Noah the reason. Underline that word. God explained to Noah the reason for the flood and for his plans. And he revealed the profound depth of sorrow and grief that man's persistence in sin had brought into the divine consciousness. Your best verses are those that are listed right there, Genesis 6, 5 through 7. God repents, change of mind that ever made man. He's grieved, he's sorrow, and twice in those three verses he said he's sorry that he ever made man. Pretty strong. But he reasons with Noah why he's going to eliminate him in 120 years. Point number two, or illustration number two, example number two, when Sodom and Gomorrah were about to be destroyed, unlimited sexual sins in these two cities. God revealed to Abraham the reasons why he was going to do it. Then one on that wonderful intercession when Abraham began to reason with God. Well, look, if there's 50 in there, would you destroy the city if there was 50 godly people? God said, no, that's not reasonable. I will not do that. And he kept moving, didn't he, till he got down to 10. Abraham didn't go any lower. God was prayed from 50 to 10 uh, righteous as a condition of sparing these cities. Who knows whether the great compassion of God could have been prayed down to maybe five or less if Abraham's confidence in God's goodness had been greater. Three, God reasoned with Moses in his call to deliver Israel when Moses hesitated. God explained to him why he needed him to lead the children of Israel out of there and the whole purpose of establishing this nation. Number four, Moses, with great meekness, reasoned with God in his great intercessory prayer when God was de determined to destroy the entire nation of Israel over the Golden Calf Rebellion. You remember when Moses was up in the mountain with God? Aaron creates from the rings and jewelry of all these people a golden calf. As soon as this thing was formed, Aaron said, there's the one that, there's the God that led us out of Egypt. All right. <clears throat> so Moses had to reason with God in his great intercessory prayer because God was going to destroy Israel because of the golden calf thing. And, and uh, Abraham, you know, he says, well, take me. See, there's a type of Christ, which he was anyway in leading them out of the world, Egypt. Take me and, and spare the rest. And God said, no, I'll, I'll crush all of them, and I'll make a whole new nation out of you, which was a type of Christ again that he did. Moses had the opportunity to replace Abraham as the head of the nation in number four, but humbly declined. God hearkened to his petition. Number five, it was Samuel who reasoned with the nation of Israel in behalf of God when they were determined to have a king. God was their king. They wanted the king. He revealed some of the main points of God's dealing with them, stated their present case. Samuel had many times a blessed fellowship with God during these times of stress. Six, King Hezekiah of Judah reasoned, and the key word down through here is reason, see, where man is going to God and, and reasoning with God. Hezekiah, king of Judah, reasoned with God to be healed and had given to him an extension of life and reign. You remember he rolled when the prophet told him he was going to die. He rolled to the face to the wall and cried out and told God that he'd faith, uh, served him faithfully and he'd done all they did ever ask and so forth. And before the prophet got out of there, he made a U-turn, came back and told him he was putting 15 years more on his life. But he reasoned with God. Had he not reasoned, he would have died because God had already sent the prophet there to tell him he was going to die. But God, as soon as the man reasoned, Hezekiah reasoned, he realized he's got a valid point. He's got faith. He's upholding it. Therefore, I can do it for him because of his faith. 
Number seven, God desires to reason with man about his own situation and the invitation of reconciliation being extended, Isaiah 118. Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Eight, God beckoned to Israel to give reasons for their disobedience and their rejection of mercy if they could. Of course, they couldn't. Number nine, again, we have God inviting an examination of a situation in Isaiah 43. Come on. Talk to me about this. Bring something back to me. Of course, there was no reply from them. Ten, God not only reasons but strongly urges mankind to evaluate their own lives and to be reconciled in forgiveness and partake of divine life. Stop and think what you're doing. Stop and think what you're doing. Come on back. I'll take you back. Page 18.11, God seeks to lift man's thoughts to the level of his, particularly on the necessity of repentance. God pleads for man to come and think with the simplicity that God is offering them to repent and come back into union. 12, God plied through Jeremiah in a most compassionate way that his people might return to obedience, inviting any complaints that they might have against God, but they didn't come back. 13, God made a final plea that Judah would listen and turn from their sins so he could spare them the planned 70 years of captivity. Jeremiah hounded them about that, but they didn't turn. 14, God thinks thoughts of goodwill. Processes of thought. What he's thinking, what he's arrived at, where he's headed with it, and why. Everything is logical, orderly, simple. Okay, <clears throat> 15, God not only invites man to think with him upon their differences, which sin has separated them, but he pleads with man to do so. 16, the Lord Jesus spent most of his earthly sojourn as the world's greatest teacher, seeking by humble, natural illustration to penetrate people's minds and get them to sit down and think over their lives and relationships to God and to each other. God longing as a result to forgive and bless all those who would repent and become a part of the kingdom of God. And every one of those that are underlined are, are very good statements of God pleading with them, reasoning with them through the Savior Christ. 17, the Holy Spirit was to continue this glorious penetrating teaching in an even greater way until the end of the age that he could convince that tells you that's his job over in uh, John 16, that he's going to convince the world of sin. He's going to convince the world of righteousness, and he's going to convince the world of final judgment. That's the Holy Spirit's job. But he needs us to go out and preach and teach and share that word in order for the convincing to take place. The Holy Ghost just doesn't run around convincing people apart from the word being spoken. Their own conscience will convict them, but the Holy Spirit is going to be used along with us. That's why in Revelation we're called the two witnesses. We, the church, and the Holy Ghost working with us, through us, and in us, and the thing that we're witnessing is the Word of God. The Holy Spirit can't do it without us. We can't do it without the Holy Spirit. It's the truth that wants to get out there. And the Holy Spirit will be doing that, will he not? Right up until the final trumpet blows, the voice of the archangel, and time is no more. Number 18, the Apostle Paul expressed his great confidence in the goodness and mercy of God to do everything possible for everyone. Romans 8, 32. Come now, let us reason together. Hmm? 19, the Bible as the Word of God was designed to be an intelligent communication from the Holy Spirit to our spiritual understanding so that we might know the things freely given to us by God. Freely. We don't have to work to get them. Spiritual work is to believe it and accept it and repent and go on with God. We don't pay any money. We don't do anything else. They're freely given. 20, God designed His Word to be so plain, so simple, so logical that it would pierce through the mental fog which we've generated for ourselves and bring full understanding of ourselves when we read with humility and the illumination of the Holy Spirit. 
21, God has taken great pains to reveal many details of the future course of this world, which he knows must end not in a thousand-year glorious reign, not ending in a great revival, but it ends in judgment. So question number four is, what was the approach of the apostles and servants of Christ in the New Testament times, particularly the apostle Paul? We see God's approach in the Old Testament through various people, through the nation, but what is it now with the servants of Christ in the New Testament? And here's some of the passages. Number one, on the day of Pentecost, they spoke forth with great learning and intelligence the mighty deeds of gods and languages which they'd never learned after the Holy Spirit was granted according to the promise of the risen Christ. Over 15 languages are recorded there from different nations. And everybody understood in their own tongue the glorious, wonderful works of God. And these men didn't even know what they were speaking. They were speaking in another language. Number two, Peter and John, with a fresh anointing of the Holy Spirit, reasoned with the people with such conviction that great numbers were converted to the gospel. The church now expanded to about 5,000 men, no doubt, plus a great number of women and older children. The conclusion of the rulers was that they spoke with such brilliance and persuasion that they must have some direct connection with the greatest teacher they'd ever heard, Jesus of Nazareth. Okay, number three, Peter and other apostles were miraculously, is that where I am? No. Miraculously delivered from prison to continue their persuasive teaching, backed up by miracles, as Christ promised, with such force that those who refused to submit were cut to the quick and were intended to slay them. The apostles were so satisfied in the revealed truth of God that they said with overflowing enthusiasm, we must obey God rather than men. Four, the religious opposition who were disputing with Deacon Stephen a man full of faith and the Holy Ghost, were completely defeated and had to resort to violence. They were unable to cope with the wisdom of the Spirit with which he was speaking. Their violence turned out to be for Stephen's good, for he received a home going from his kind master that he might not have otherwise known as he sweetly fell asleep. In his going, he no doubt did irreparable damage to a violently intelligent young man named Saul, who could not have but been confounded by his spirit-giving reasoning powers and compassion departure from this life. Made a great impact on Paul. Five, Philip was directed to meet the chariot of the Ethiopian eunuch and guide him into an understanding of the Scripture until he was saved and went on his way, rejoicing. Six, God is now declaring to men that all everywhere should repent because he has fixed or appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed. This repentance apart from which was no salvation was such a change of mind that a changed life always resulted. There was only one final approach to such a revolution of life only through the reason as the powerful claims of truth were presented in a deep burden of prayer. Thus the humble but a great apostle Paul went everywhere with his God-given intellectual understanding to confound men's minds as he proclaimed the kingdom or the moral government of God and the glorious gospel of the grace of God. Continuing on in our participation in God's activities, example number seven on page 20, the church in Thessalonica was founded when, according to Paul's custom, he for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the Scriptures. Our gospel did not come to you in word only, he said, but only in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. You turn to God from idols and to serve a living and true God, having received the word in much tribulation with the joy of the Holy Spirit. 8. At Athens, Paul was reasoning in the synagogue with the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles, and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be present, also with the philosophers on experiencing reconciliation to God through personal repentance. 9. At Corinth, Paul was reasoning in the synagogue every Sabbath and trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. 
he began devoting himself completely to the Word, staying a year and a half. 10. At Ephesus, Paul entered the synagogue and continued speaking out boldly for three months, reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God, which was totally invisible and uh, not seen by them. He later was reasoning daily in the school of Tyrannus for two years, so that all who lived in Asia heard the word of the Lord. Number 11. The Roman ruler Felix sent to Paul to hear about faith in Christ Jesus. Instead of Telling him simply to believe, Paul discussed righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, the principles of God's moral government, which required a rethinking of his whole, Felix's whole life. Felix became frightened, as many do, and was unwilling to do this. Number 12, hearing Paul's spirit-anointed words of sober truth in his defense, the Roman ruler Festus spoke to Paul or of Paul's great learning, while King Agrippa said, in a short time, you will persuade me to become a Christian, which he never did. But you understand how powerful the reasoning, logic, presentation must have been with the Word of God working on their conscience. And yet they had the power to restrain from coming to Christ. Thirteen, as large numbers came to Paul's place of confinement in Rome, he was explaining to them by solemnly testifying about the kingdom of God trying to persuade them concerning Jesus from both the law of Moses and from the prophets from morning until evening. Some were being persuaded by the things spoken, but others would not believe. 14. Paul stayed two full years in his own rented quarters in Rome, which he was put to death while he was there. But he had his rented quarters with a guard, and he was free to have anybody in preach all he wanted to. Two full years his own rented quarters, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching concerning the Lord Jesus Christ. Five, the question, can we be God's fellow workers as the light of the world if we are not enthusiastic and Christ-like in motive and conduct? And back here, the page that we just went by is uh, light, truth, revelation, the universal standard of conduct, And it deals with uh, three major points here. God is light in the absolute sense. Our Lord Jesus put moral light of the Godhead on exhibition. And the third point, those reconciled to God are now the light of the world. And you can go back and read all of the parts of scriptures that he's inserted in there. They're tremendous. That's, That's the light all put on on one page by Olson. Now, number one here on page 21 To witness, he's going to define what witness is in. To witness is to represent something or someone with our whole personality. From these remarks, we can readily conclude that we cannot be any kind of effective witness for our blessed Lord unless, highlight that, unless we are willing to be genuine and wholehearted in our inner lives. Number two, thus to represent Christ in any true sense. Underline this, we must be enthusiastic and Christ-like in our motive and conduct. The third step, to be Christ-like, we must be transformed continually. Highlight those two words. Continually transformed by the indwelling Holy Spirit and the humble walk of faith. The Christian life is not intended to be a set of regulations which we are to try to live by, but an intimate spiritual relationship with the resurrected and glorified Christ. In point six, Olson's sixth question, how is God's wisdom and energy released through the servants of Christ? The Lord Jesus had promised the energy of the Holy Spirit for those presenting the claims of God. The bestowment of the Holy Spirit is to be distinguished from the gifts or operation of the Holy Spirit. That's true, although we've got to make some corrections here with some of his statements. That is a true statement. And in introducing the Lord Jesus, in introducing the Lord Jesus, John said, He himself will baptize you or overwhelm you with the Holy Spirit and fire. The new relationship of the Holy Spirit as the indwelling helper, illuminator, and energizer would be so profound that the Savior said, it is to your advantage, to your success, to your profit that I go away. 
For if I do not go away or go back to heaven, the Helper, the Holy Ghost, shall not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. That is, Christ had to go back as the king. He had to go back as the sacrifice. He had to be accepted by God in heaven as done the complete work, and then God could pour the Holy Spirit out. But the Holy Spirit couldn't come in personal indwelling until that happened. Now, remember, the Holy Ghost was always present on the priests, kings, and prophets of the Old Testament. But he could not come to dwell inside until we were made clean first by the work of Christ. Then he had to be accepted in heaven, then poured out. B, this new relationship of power and energy was bestowed on the day of Pentecost on each one of the about 120 disciples who had banded together in prayer and were observing the prescribed feast day. Immediately in great physical manifestation, they were filled with profound concepts of truth and presented the claims of God fluently to multitudes gathered in the temple area in languages which they had never learned so that all would understand. And uh, never learned, just remember, they weren't learning them there either. They were speaking in a, a language they didn't know. It was still unknown to them, but it was known language and used for the purpose of validating God's power in this whole thing. Peter explained the great new manifestation from the prophecies of the pouring out of the Holy Spirit. C, endless increasing climaxes or filling of the Holy Spirit are to be experienced as daily needs and opportunity for ministry arises as the gift of operations of the Holy Spirit are bestowed. Remember now, the Holy Spirit dwells within us. He can dispense any of the nine gifts he wishes through us at any time. It is he that's resident, not the gifts. He will divide the gifts as he tells us he's going to. The apostle Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, but when, he, but when called before the rulers, we read, then Peter, having been filled with the Spirit, said to them, uses a climactic tense. <clears throat> All right? Peter then, having been filled with the Holy Spirit, that is, he was again raising his voice, beginning to speak, and the Spirit was continually filling him with his presence. It doesn't mean he was getting it again, or he had to go to the gas station and keep getting refillings. Now, this is the teaching you get from people who've never been baptized with the Holy Ghost. But you only get saved once. You don't keep getting re-saved or re-saved down the line any more than baptized with the Holy Ghost. The refilling or any other experience would have to be you raising your voice and being filled with the Holy Spirit and praying over somebody or being blessed somehow, and you're rejoicing and you're being filled with him, his presence there, not him coming in for the first time, but being filled with his presence. Climactic tense means that he must have just come off a high relationship somewhere in the Spirit at that moment. After threatening them, they were released and had a moving time of prayer with their companions, whereupon they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. Again, they raised their voice, see. They began to speak the word of God with boldness. But they were all filled as meant simply that they were being filled at that moment with the presence of the Holy Ghost by raising their own voice. And you don't wait for God to do this. This is something, once you're baptized with the Holy Ghost, you can raise your voice and begin to speak in tongues and you are being filled with the presence of the Holy Ghost, you're activating him at that moment to speak through you in a language you don't know. We read that Stephen, full of grace and power, was performing great wonders and signs among the people, so that the opposers were unable to cope with the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. Be continually filled with the Spirit. Yes, continually in use of you praying and speaking in the language you don't know. The apostle admonished. It involved a continual seeking for a climactic energy to be bestowed. And yes, you're going to raise your voice and pray, and God will meet that. Point number two, God's, God's program now is for the spiritual church as the body of which Christ is the head to be an integral operating unit, animated by the Holy Spirit with all members contributing to the activity.
Point number three on page 33. Two important facts are revealed concerning the bestowal of spiritual gifts. A. Spiritual gifts are modes of operation of the Holy Spirit within and through humble servants of Christ, and they're not permanent deposits given to us as our own possession and independent control or use as we choose. That's absolutely true. We have Him, the Holy Spirit. He's the one that divides the various operations. This is brought about in 1 Corinthians 12, where we have present tenses of durative action. Durative action. Now to each one is being given the manifestation of the Spirit towards that which is profitable. For to this one, through the Spirit, is being given a word of wisdom. A wisdom means some revelation about the future. It's supernatural. You don't have any knowledge of it, of what God's going to do in the future. could be minutes later, day later, hour, next week. To another, the word of knowledge, something that's happened in the past that you don't know about or something that's happening at this moment that's already in existence, people's thoughts that you don't know anything about and God reveals it to you according to the same spirit. Though all these things is working, the one and the self same spirit, he himself, distributing or dividing them apart separately to each one according as he, the Holy Ghost, is willing. We have no control over that. B, the Holy Spirit is absolutely sovereign as to what gifts he may choose to manifest in each one of us. True. As quoted above, he is distributing separately to each one according as he is willing or purposing or desiring. We are all, however, to covet earnestly the best or the greater gifts, which are defined for us in chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians. Then in Page 34.4, the following enumeration of spiritual gifts appear in the New Testament. This is very good. He gives you the list out of Ephesians 4 and then some 11 through 16, apostles, prophets, evangelists, teachers, uh, pastors, and teachers. Their job is to equip the saints for the work of the service. The so we're to go out and do the work. <clears throat> They're not the workhorse. They are to train us to go out and do the work all over the world. Then out of 1 Corinthians 12, 7 through 11, wisdom, knowledge, faith, hearing, miracles, prophecy, distinguishing or discerning the spirits, tongues, and interpretation. Out of 1 Corinthians 12, 28 through 31, apostles, prophets, teachers, miracles, healings, helps, administrations, and tongues. And uh, he has their order of importance. Scratch that out. They are not given in an order of importance. Each one has its own use, and one or the other may be more important at any given time than the other. But men who are not baptized of the Holy Ghost, who are not taught, don't understand it. Then out of Romans 12, 4 through 8, we have these listed, prophecy, service, teaching, exhortation, giving, leadership, and mercy. In Ephesians 4, 7, and 11 through 16, here we notice that the saints are to do the greater part of the ministry in our Christian service of one form for another, and that pastors and teachers, and uh, you need to draw a line through apparently one office. That's not a true statement. Pastors and teachers are two separate people. Pastors should be apt to teach, but there's teachers that are not pastors. All right? And that pastors and teachers are to prepare and guide them in their service. B, out of 1 Corinthians 12, 7 through 11, the general concept seems to be that each one of us will possess or receive the Holy Spirit's operation and only a few of these gifts. And to possess, and you need to just box that in because we aren't going to possess any of them, to manifest all nine would be an extreme rarity. We don't possess, and all we do is manifest them. It appears, however, that probably Paul did manifest all nine. Then again, the Holy Spirit may stress one area of operation in our lives or in the church at large at one period or another at a different period. So God may use different gifts at different times. You've heard so often people running around say, I've got the gift of healing, or i got the gift of discernment, or this, that, and the other. Uh, they don't know what they're saying. They may be used by God, but that does not mean they have a particular gift. I think I told you one night we were in the Assemblies of God uh, retirement home, Twin Towers, in the uh, Santa Ana, no, it would be uh, Newport Beach, California. I knew the man. He was a former superintendent of the Assemblies of God, Ellie Halverson, and he invited Joe Jordan and I down to minister in this retirement home. They had 350 people, Assembly of God people that retired and living in these two big homes. And uh, that night we held a service, just one night, 
And we preached on uh, faith and healing, I believe it was. And at the end, we had no knowledge of this. At the end, we asked if anybody wanted to be healed uh, to come up and uh, we'd pray for them. And uh, 60-some people jumped right out of their seats and got in line. And all we saw that night was one right after another, the healing of eyes. Every one of them had eye problems. The little film that covers their eyes, I don't know what that terminology is, but cataracts. Sixty-seven people were healed of cataracts, cataracts right in a row. Now, Joe and I could have steamed out of there and said, we got, a, uh, we got the gift of healing cataracts, bless God. But I never saw another cataract healed after that. But that night, God specialized to these people in healing them from cataracts, every one of them. And Ellie Halverson, who'd seen all the great revivals in California, said to us afterwards, I have never seen anything like this in my life. We said, we haven't either. Praise the Lord. After everyone was healed, we made them stand there and raise their hands and praise God. We don't want to take the glory for that. 1 Corinthians 12, 28 through 31, this passage establishes beyond question the divine order of importance of the various spiritual gifts mentioned. Just put the word no. The gifts are viewed as embodied in individuals established or appointed in the church. Yes, but they're not an order of importance because they do that because tongues is the next to the last one. And anybody that hasn't been filled with the Holy Ghost wants to make tongues the least of the gifts. Why, in a church service, there may be somebody who will give a message in tongues, somebody give the interpretation. That's the greatest thing a spirit's going to do in that service as far as uh, a spiritual manifestation. <coughs> so they're not in order of importance. That's what these non-spirit-filled people say. Then D, the Romans 12, 4 through 8, the expression according to the proportion of his faith indicates our response, yes, an initiative in bringing about a greater maturity and development in spiritual gifts. Where is the limit of the look of faith? There is no limit. Shall we not be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love? Yes. And follow the admonition of our blessed Lord, do business until I come? Yes. He who goes to and fro weeping, carrying his bag of seed, shall indeed come again with a shout of joy, bringing his sheaves with him. For who is our hope or joy or crown of exaltation? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus at his coming? For you, Paul says, are our glory and joy. Now is the day of opportunity and the challenge to impart our glorious gospel to a needy world. And praise the Lord. Thank you for remaining through this teaching. Again, it's the most difficult longest of all of their teaching well probably isn't longer than the old testament but um, it is a long teaching and it's the only time we read another man's writings i've told you before why i do it it's the best out there and i wanted to take somewhere in our entire course i wanted to pick somebody's book or manual and go through it to show you even when you read somebody else's work you must have your pen in your hand and be able to judge his writings by the Word of God. Because not necessarily everything that they say will be in line with the Word. Even as honest as they may be, it may be not in line with God's Word. So I thank God for Olson and what he did and what he wrote. And I pray that when Olson died, he went to home to be with the Lord and suddenly realized that he'd missed the boat on the Holy Spirit. And... Um, that I'll look forward to seeing him someday when I get there. Praise the Lord.